everyone. This is, we're towards the end now, so um, hopefully we can make this as fun as possible for all of you, okay? So in order to make this fun, what I did was I actually, I'm trying something completely new. I'm going to try to stitch together a number of different things, a number of different trends, and then um, speak to you about um, what I think should matter to VR um, uh, in the next 10 years as we build out the, um, the, MR, the XR space. So first and foremost, I think what's important is, there we go, is to talk about the context first, okay? So what are these three things that I want to stitch together? Well, the first thing I want to start to refer to is that in Canada, because that's where I'm from, um, the whole idea of critiquing and understanding VR really began in 1991, when the BAM Center of the Arts um, held a two-day seminar called the Bio Apparatus, um, helmed by Catherine Richards and Nell Tenhoff. And they brought together a whole variety of artists, like David Rokeby, um, Michael Joyce, uh, a whole variety of people, Char Davies, um, the, the, the initial kind of thinkers of um, what embodied technologies mean to really start to unpack the relationship between the body, technology, society, etc. And artists are really important for us when we're starting to imagine how we should be thinking about VR because they present a totally different view than, than, than most technologists have. And in, 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 in particular, they really understand, as it says here in the introduction to the bioapparatus, um, that we need to see technology as not neutral, but embedded in social and cultural contexts, right? And so what happened was, from that 1991 seminar, the BAM Center created this um, five-year study helmed by Michael Century um, and created a project called the Art and Virtual Environments Project. Um, and indeed, um, Brenda Laurel, who spoke two days earlier, um, was one of those artists that, that, that um, did projects there. And this, all the projects and all the findings and insights around VR are aggregated in this book created by, um, written by Mary Mary Ann Moser and Douglas McLeod called Immersed in Technology. So understanding what should matter in VR, we really should go back to that time in the 90s and see what the artists wrote about it, okay? And then let's put that aside in one bucket and then fast forward to what else should we be thinking about? Well, the next thing that we should be thinking about is what are the, the dominant trends that have been impacting the sort of socio-political context, those contexts that are all important for us to situate technology around? Well, I think the three dominant trends that we're seeing can be kind of um, um, unpacked through these uh, three different types of books, right? First is this trend towards inequality that was made mainstream by Thomas Piketty's book. The second, obviously, is the, the trend around, um, around uh, climate change, um, which George Monbiot, through his books and on the Guardian articles that he writes, talks about, and now we can no longer refute. And then most recently is the, is the kind of uh, um, findings helmed again by Sherry Turkle, or as one of the key academics in the space, about the relationship that we have with technology and how technology is actually impacting our lives. So we need to see um, uh, technology within the context of these three trends. And then fast forward to today, what has also become quite clear is that the business context of technology has become such that we're really now living in a monopoly-driven type of climate, right? So the democratized uh, web that we all anticipated in the early 90s that those artists in Banff were thinking about and already starting to critique um, was still yet fairly decentralized, or that's the thinking that we had. Um, and then today, what we see are the, the kind of monopolies emerging um, that's really dominating the way we think about technology. And the, the, the problem, though, is although we understand that these monopolies are, are a problem and that there have been certain issues that have emerged, as I said in the introduction with the Cambridge Analytica scandals, the echo chambers that, are, that have ensued as a result of these um, types of platforms that we have, Technology is not going to stop, right? It's going to continue to gallop. And so what we've been hearing for the past three days is this convergence between all of these different technologies that 
could be construed as this new XR space, right? So you've got immersive media, you've got IoT, you've got um, AI, and you've got cybersecurity. And lo and behold, we are actually creating the building blocks for what this future will be. And we need to make sure we're not building them in a way that um, basically repeat the mistakes that we're seeing today. So do we want to build this next computing platform um, under the same kinds of conditions and challenges that we now see ourselves in present day web? Or do we want to make sure we don't make the same mistakes? The good news is that there's a whole new generation of people that have emerged, the digital natives, OK? And so this is, a, this is an audience, and they're, they're either the audience that we're going to start to need to pay attention to, or the creators that are going to make a difference. But these are um, what I'm terming, or not me, but Michael Tallon in this wonderful Medium post um, uh, is calling the magic kids. So these are the kind of highly politicized, young, um, I'm not even sure what you call them, like uh, X gener not X geners, but post-millennial kids who understand technology, but who mobilize to make change in their current reality, in real life. So I think there's this new trend that's emerging where you might have a new generation of people who are a little bit more political than what we ourselves might find ourselves um, being. So this is the kind of context that we're in. Um, I th and we have to figure out how do we then start to manage um, how to create t these building blocks for the next XR uh, computing platform, or how to think about the work that we're doing. And I'm going to go through about 11 different um, um, ideas with you guys now. So the first thing, obviously, and, and we've heard this all throughout the, the three days here, um, Ori started with it by saying that you need to be accountable um, uh, as we're building this XR platform, is we really definitely need to be vigilant about privacy, right? So anything we build needs to have that at its core, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because the regulatory environment is changing. So um, with the GDPR that came out in the EU, you've got Oculus on May 20th changing the way they're doing their privacy um, policies. And in fact, uh, you can now look at your My Privacy, um, what do they call it, center, uh, to see what, you, what, what they're actually capturing and gathering from you. But obviously, this is not necessarily um, a wholesale change throughout the industry, because we also have Korean company Luxid Labs, um, who's building a headset that not just uh, gathers data, um, you know, physical data, but also biofeedback data, brain waves, et cetera. And they're the darling of all sorts of um, consumer um, uh, sort of uh, uh, contests and things like that, having won CES last year, et cetera. So obviously, this notion of vigilance and privacy is not um, necessarily adopted across the board. But I think that's going to be something that we all need to think about. Um, we also can't just think about privacy in terms of making sure that um, we do what's right for our consumers. I think what we're finding is there's going to be a whole bunch of angry consumers that are going to start to demand data justice. So this is a new term that's starting to percolate in academia and other kinds of sectors. Um, it's probably not a term that any of you guys have heard on the floor. In fact, I'd be curious, who has heard the term data justice? OK, that's my point. And so um, data justice is essentially the, the study of um, uh, you know, analytics from a social justice perspective. And it can include a whole variety of things from data discrimination, um, algorithmic governance, so how are al algorithms designed? Um, have, has confirmation bias been designed into algorithms? How do you make sure that you don't do that? Um, all the way to data-related activism and advocacy. Um, and in fact, a really good thing to read if you've never done, if you've never read anything about data justice, is the chapter in Making a New Reality around this very um, um, uh, 
issue. Um, Making a New Reality is um, a Ford Foundation-sponsored um, set of articles in Medium about the virtual reality industry. It's authored by Kamal Sinclair from Sundance um, Institute. And one of the chapters that she writes about is this idea of um, design justice, et cetera. And then there's quite a number of resources around how you might start to think about um, designing for these new types of experiences and how in VR, as especially if you're doing documentaries, you would work and relate to the subjects that you're covering as you're, as you're doing these documentaries. So this is a, as an example of a network that has a, a, a number of design principles that you might follow when you're creating these types of experiences. So, you know, the most important thing when you're talking about data justice is you actually have to start signaling the right things. And so this is, everyone knows what this is, yes? This was the um, uh, uh, sort of uh, Mark Zuckerberg touring Puerto Rico just after um, the hurricane hit. Um, and as we all know, um, that, you know, that was not really the right place probably to do this kind of virtual tourism in at that time. Um, and so it's very important that as the, the people with the power and the access to these technologies, that we actually start to signal the right things to our consumers and to our other stakeholders. Um, and more importantly, I think, we need to really understand what it means to be diverse and integrated. So as we know, there's been a lot of um, effort in trying to be more inclusive. It was really heartening to see the XR for Good track here, um, and for many of the speakers here to uh, call for gender parity on stage, etc. cetera. Um, but we have to go beyond just this notion of um, uh, creating diverse teams, etc. but also also to figure out how we might want to think about um, how we're designing diverse experiences with the medium itself. So um, Char Davies really talked about this in the 90s when she says, you know, we really need to think about VR as the potential, as a, the arena for exploring consciousness and not just as an arena for exploring um, the, you know, the photo real life that we live in. So how can we ensure that the types of products and content and experiences that we're designing um, are as diverse as they possibly can be, and in fact, try to unpack um, some of the more complicated things that, that we have to grapple with, which is like, who are we as humans? What is the human condition? What is consciousness, et cetera? Um, another really important thing, and again, this is something that has um, plagued, you know, this generation of tech companies, is we need to start driving towards a values-based business model. Um, we know that this didn't go very well for Uber, um, and that that's starting to affect them. Um, the values-based business model is definitely related to um, this idea of inequality. Um, this is a graph from the International Labor Organization from 2016 that shows the differences between the hourly wages of the top 1% and the bottom 1%. This, this, the, the center will not hold in this kind of context, right? So we need to start thinking about what value are we actually giving to our stakeholders and to our consumers and to the people who are buying our products. Um, one way to maybe start thinking about that is to re-examine what we mean by value. And so there's a new book that came out recently by Mariana Matsukato called The Value of Everything, where she really wants us to unpack our notion of what value means. And in this instance, she says, you know, um, price equals value thinking, um, you know, really, uh, 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 disabuses us from understanding that value creation is a collective process. Um, and I think a, a really great example of um, uh, what that looks like is what the, the previous speaker spoke about, right? Because this notion of starting to marry um, the kind of co-creative production and consumption that's inherent in digital media 
with the type of cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies that are now present may just be the answer to that problem that uh, Maria Mazzucato is talking about. So in cases like Decentraland, in cases like what Otto is trying to do, um, they're really looking at building towards open standards where the, 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 the uh, audience or the consumers are producers of the, of the work itself. So the, 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 the technology for production and the technology for consumption are the, are the same things, and you're co-creating um, the value together. Um, and you're deriving um, you know, monetary value as a result. So I think that's a really interesting um, uh, trend that we're starting to see. Um, and if you can't do the blockchain thing, well, at least we should be resolute about payment. So that goes both ways. Um, be resolute about pay paying creators and perhaps thinking about how we would pay participants who are co-creating um, value with us. But also, as creators, don't give your stuff away for free. Um, and what's happening is we actually have a change in the way audiences are behaving towards um, their, you know, uh, um, uh, favorite creators. Um, Farhad Manju in the New York Times started to note that you've got lots of um, subscription-based services in media starting to emerge. And I think we need to start thinking about these models as perhaps a new way to start to monetize these virtual reality creations that we're, we're doing. Um, a good example of this is Flipside XR, which is a company we're actually accelerating in the accelerator that I'm the managing director of, Idea Boost. Um, Flipside allows you to create um, animated VR shows, but also has a distribution platform that has direct to consumer monetization payment systems embedded. Um, before the time runs out, we need to be network aware, okay? This is something that we always, we forgot, I think, in many ways, as, as, especially as narrative creators in the, in, during the, the first um, generation of the computing platform, the web and mobile, where the types of ex experiences we, weren't, we were creating weren't really paying attention to network effects as much. Um, this is an example. Lots of networked art was made during the early 2000s. This is uh, eCloud by Dan Goods, Nick Haffermas, and Aaron Koblen um, in the San Jose airport call, uh, that was made in 2007. Um, so a good example of this, and it's the only one that I've seen to date, um, is actually one that was in the art artistic playground, which is called Where Thoughts Go, um, a social VR narrative by Lucas Rosato. So here you've got um, a piece of VR work where um, uh, it, you're very um, conscious of the fact that there, ha there are um, per other participants in the experience because they leave um, these dreams and messages for you to find and you're invited to also leave your own dream and message um, based on the questions that Lucas asks you of this in the social narrative. So I think we need to start thinking about where these, these network-aware pieces are and, and, and demand them. But we also have to be wary about the fact that, you know, we have to be sensitive to the nefarious parts of net network effects. Um, we see this in the fake news stuff on the web, um, but definitely in VR, what we're seeing is are these network effects um, uh, through social VR spaces um, and the kinds of harassment that take place. So this is a recent survey, and it's, you know, I don't need to read it out loud for you guys, but um, essentially, there's a problem that we still need to fix. Um, and the last two points I don't really have good examples for, um, but basically I think there, we need to have a rallying call where uh, a, a concerted effort towards restoring the public commons is very important. So I still think probably the most um, telling examples of that are the types of open standards, open metaverses that a number of the d different um, companies and developers are, are either designing or paying attention 
attention to. Um, but I think it need, also needs to have some kind of public intention around it. So how do we create the parks, the parklands that are for collective use in this metaverse that we're creating? How is that being, um, how, how are we creating the governance structures around that? And then last but not least, in order for us to actually make these things, um, all of us need to commit to an ethical framework. And the good news is that uh, a lot of uh, different um, organizations are starting to look at um, the ethics of data, the ethics of uh, the ethics of participation, the ethics of um, technology use, and really understanding how we can design with intention um, with knowing that there may very well be unintended consequences um, for the future. Thank you.